So what is a portfolio and how do you set it up? So the 800 words has nothing to do with the evidence for it. Evidence does not count in the words. That means the CV and the covering letter do not count in the 800 words. The 800 words is a reflective commentary. Now, why do I want you to have a reflective commentary? So being reflective is an important part of critical thinking. A re being a reflective person means that you have an experience, something happens to you and you think about that thing and you think, did it go well? Did it go badly? If it went well, are you going to take that forward so you repeat doing the same thing again? If it went badly, what do you need to change so that it doesn't go badly ever again? So, for example, every time you do a teaching class, it's a different experience. So anybody who thinks you can sit and train people how to become teachers or lecturers is and there's a, a defined operating procedure for how to teach is completely uh, deluded because every experience you get is unique it's going to be different every time so you can tell the most successful students because they are reflective they're people who got a 40 percenter in their first year and they realized why they got a 40 percenter in their first year what they did wrong and they come up with a development plan for their own change so that they never do it again reflective students are not always perfect but they always have a development plan and they're always thinking and about their behavior and reflecting on it and being reflective is really important. It's a characteristic of first class students. You can see them a mile away and it comes through in every single piece of work they ever do. So here is the reflective portfolio. Uh, here is. Uh, so what you can do is from the basic page of uh, Blackboard, you click on tools and it gives you these things, which are portfolios. Click on portfolio and then usually it'll be blank. I've got two portfolios created already. You do create a portfolio. Now you create a portfolio in your name. Do you wish to create it using your ID? No, you don't. Is it going to be anonymously marked? No, it isn't. Why not? Because it's got your CV in it and that has your name on the top of it. It's marked by your supervisor. So the same person who's going to supervise your project next year and is doing your literature review this year is sent it, not your personal tutor. So every year we get some sent to the personal tutor and they end up not being marked or disappearing off the face of the earth. And we end up having to chase people who we think have not submitted their portfolio when they have just to the wrong person. Goes to your supervisor. So you put in the name for it. So here, I'm going to make this one for Sweeney Todd. He's a nice person who's very good at barbering and excellent at making meat pies. Well, his friend is anyway. So we'll come to how you send it and what you do with it in a minute. So there's the title of your name. Now you select the portfolio template. There are lots of templates here for different degree pathways and different things you do. So here's the Fellowship of the Higher Education Academy, which is what lecturers do which is a reflective portfolio where we think about our teaching and our experience and what we've done in our career so that we can become a professional body, a member of the professional body. There's another one here, which is senior fellow. So I've done that one as well because I'm a senior fellow, not an, and so I'm the next level up in the professional body. What do you want to do is what's called the student learning record. So this particular thing was created as a document to go besides your degree to show all your transferable skills. 
It was created uh, so that this could be shared with your personal tutor so that when they come to write a reference, they've got a clear view of all the things you've done and all the skills you have. It is somewhat extensive. So I pressed OK. So it said that it's going to use the student le learning record. I then press submit. So I press submit to pick it. Then I press submit to actually create it. It says, do you want to take a tour? I'm a man, so no. I don't ask for directions. I never read a manual. And I'm not going to ask for a tour now. No, thanks. I'll explore it on my own. That was a sexist generalization, but unfortunately, pretty true. Now, the portfolio, as I said, covered every single transferable skill that was ever possible that you could ever get. So it's got core skills. So how good are you in managing your own learning? How good are you at time management? How good are you at reflection? Had academic skills. So it asks you how good are you at reading and note taking? How good are you at managing information? Do you know what plagiarism and referencing is? Do you, what are your online skills? How good are you at academic writing? Have you done presentations and posters? Do you know about a revision and exam skills, project skills, numeracy, laboratory skills? See, laboratory skills, not that much out of a, trans, uh, not a large part of all transferable skills. Now, the only part of this portfolio I want you to fill in is this the work the one that is to do with employability so the employability part of the portfolio has four sections which you need to fill in the four sections are work experience networking social media and curriculum vital writing so it should just say cv writing it's pedantic to call it that what you have within here is two little boxes. One, which I can click on going, write stuff here. So that is where I can write stuff. So it's due in April, but I would do it a lot sooner than that. So remember, this is 800 words. So I want 800 words across these four boxes. That is your reflective commentary, not the actual evidence of things. So to add evidence, you do edit artifact and you can add PDFs, newspaper articles. You can add any kind of document you like to it. So or in PDFs and also images. Right. So you can put those things in to support what you've written in the box. Now, in terms of work experience, you might have some evidence like letters of employment giving you the job offer. You could even have something as simple as a photo of you doing your job. Uh, I don't want pay slips or things like that. If you have no extra evidence in terms of artifacts, then you're going to have to use what's called STAR situation task uh, i can't remember what the uh, achievement and something of result what's the a stand for anyway you'll have to document important examples of events and things that happened within that employment action and result that's the one i want i can even remember action so for example, well the example i've given is working in mcdonald's and trying to deal with awkward customers what kind of evidence would you expect anything so evidence for work experience a picture of your lanyard from where you worked that shows absolutely with no shadow of a doubt you worked there a picture of you doing the job is fine anything anything at all be creative if you really have nothing as an uh, edit artifact, then you'll have to use situation, task, action, result. Yes, an email is fine. I don't need necessarily the full ID card. Just take a photo of it. It's all good. Anything does it. Letters. Yeah, anything. Anything. So you take out 
the photo of those is, and embed it as a JPEG. You put it in as a, a PDF. Any work experience of your entire life, and that includes volunteering or placements or community work, anything you've done which involves other people. No, you put as much in as you want to. So I said, you've got 800 words. You have to use those words wisely. You could put 600 in work experience, uh, 50 in each of uh, networking and social media skills and 100 in uh, curriculum writing and CB writing. You just have to use 800 words and there has to be something in each one of the boxes. So the standard silly mistake, which I tell them absolutely every year not to do, is just put your CV in here. Because that's not reflection of writing a CV. I want reflection. It says on the tin, reflective commentary. If you don't do it, you don't get the marks. So that's a simple way of losing two marks out of 20 without doing almost anything. And all you had to do was write some reflection. Yes, the whole thing has to be done by April, but if you can't write 800 words in three hours, possibly you've got a problem because you're not having to learn anything. You're not, uh, you're not doing anything new. You're just reflecting on your experience anytime. So if I was writing it now, I'd reflect on my uh, work experience from now back to when I started working when I was 16 years old. So that would be the last 34 years. I take the relevant experiences out of it. Reflection is in all four sections. No reflection, no marks. So what do you do with the CV? You submit that as one of the artifacts. That is your evidence. So if uh, you could do that, but why do that? So the cover letter and CV go in your artifacts, two separate artifacts. You can have as many artifacts under these things as you like. So someone will say, oh, well, uh, I've done lots of different uh, jobs, but I haven't got evidence for all of them. Don't need evidence for all of them. I just need at least some evidence. Doesn't say it has to be absolutely everything you've ever done, but it has to be something solid and concrete. So work experience in general will be reasonably easy to do. Curriculum writing will definitely be easy to do. Yes, part-time jobs, any job, any working, any volunteering counts as work experience. Any community work. As I said, any kind of evidence works. The cover letter goes in CV writing. So the artifacts under CV writing are the cover letter and the CV. Then the commentary is saying what you needed to do. So we'll come back to the CV and what you need to do in a little bit because I'll show the marking criteria. Yes, only employability. Um, upcoming experience you can talk about in work experience. So let's talk about the tricky two networking and social media skills. Now, networking is by far the most un poorly understood category uh, of the portfolio. And unfortunately for you, one of the most important. As a side note, when you're writing stuff, occasionally the website crashes. So you can, if you've written a lot in this textbook box, you can lose it. So I would suggest you write something in Word, and it will also check the spelling, and then you cut it and paste it into the box, your reflective commentary. So you've got another copy of it 
as well. Yes, every time you save it, you come back to it. It's not submitted. I'll show you about submitting later. Uh, yes, you are going to cover your work experience in the CV by describing it, but you're not reflecting on it in the CV. Remember what I said, reflection is it. That's the point to make sure you're reflective. So reflection on networking. So what is networking? Why is networking important and why do you need to do it and what is it? Connecting with people within the industry. It is often said it's not what you know, but who you know. It's about building communities of knowledge and experience. If you have a personal connection with somebody, they are much more likely to hire you. So by going to careers events, meetings of professional bodies like conferences, webinars now because we're in COVID, anywhere where you can bump into other people who you may later be applying for a job with is networking. If you're going to need their help later, it's good if you've met them. So I once went uh, to a competition which was, it was a bit like Dragon's Den. In fact, yeah, it was modeled pretty much on Dragon's Den where we were just doing it as a, uh, as a role playing exercise, trying to create a business plan and sell it to these people. But the people who they got in to do this particular event were genuine uh, dragons, so genuine investment experts. And when we finished the meeting and we were sitting there, and one thing they said is, if you genuinely in the future come up with an idea, contact us make that connection. I know it's a weak connection and we'd only met them in this particular program for maybe one or two days, but use your connection book, use your little black book of networking. So being in mentoring programs, a fantastic way of getting, building a network. Networking is often hard. It means a lot of schmoozing. Uh, my dad built his entire career out of networking. So he did not have a degree. He didn't have uh, any of the academic skills or background or CV that you'd need to get higher positions. But he could schmooze like you'd never imagined. So by the time he was older, he was an invited uh, member of panels of, de of decision making panels for the government and a senior invited expert for the Department of Agriculture and also the Scottish office. So he went on government fact finded missions with ministers and was an advisor in Quangos, but he had absolutely no qualifications whatsoever other than he could network like you can't imagine. And he did it by learning and also because he was a big Scotch drinker. So he found a connection through finding all the fellow Scotch drinkers. I know another person who goes to conferences and uh, uh, who was a professor and he was in the smoking corner with some of the other professors. So he built his network by them all being in the smoking corner. Probably not the best way of building a network. Uh, being a smoker, lung cancer, here we come, but yeah, I'm going to have a high flying career first. Lots of people feel uncomfortable and some people feel socially uncomfortable. I hated it, absolutely detest it, and it has impacted on my career continuously because I have never done very much of it. 
Uh, it is something you cannot afford to neglect if you're going to rise and be very successful. If you're happy to sit around in the middle of the pack, then it's slightly less important. Uh, so as I said, my dad was a big schmoozer. He wanted to invite me to see all of his, the people he knew at Cambridge University and, and various other places. And I said no, and he was furious because he wanted to open the doors and use his connections. Why not? Because I don't like social situations, particularly not when I was that age, when I was 18, 19, 20. Uh, when I started teaching, I used to get almost sick before going into a class because I got that nervous of being in front of an audience. And the first classes I taught were six people. Eventually, I got to the point of, uh, I, I just don't even think about it anymore. But I still, if I'm at a conference, if I'm surrounded by people that I know reasonably well and we're all the same sort of junior level, then it's fine. But the big names still freak me out. And I mean, I have had nice chatty conversations with people like Percy Diaconis and Percy is professor of uh, statistics. And I can't remember if it's Stanford or Yale or something. Uh, but then I've had chats with other people who have just terrified the hell out of me. Uh, and have been Nobel laureates and really scared me to death. How did I, so I talk about this in the slides. I, did. I became a local politician because I was invited to do so and they couldn't find any other candidates for the party that I happened to belong to. And so I got used to going and knocking on doors and meeting people, not kissing babies, but going to social events and having to be social because I was a politician and therefore it was required. I'm not suggesting that you all jump off the deep end and put yourself in such awkward situations, uh, but you perhaps need to push yourself a bit sometimes. Okay. Oops. Missed the time. Networking is important. Try and do some. There's something that in particular that you can do, which falls on the border between networking and social media. Now, because of COVID, the, the two are getting blurred because a lot of the networking is now happening online. Look at the career service, find events that are happening online that allow you to uh, do networking. Uh, the cover letter is a separate thing to the CV. completely so it should be the guide to what they should look at at your cv and also tell them why you should have the job and it should be targeted so i'll come to that in a bit right so there's a thing which is linkedin so linkedin if you've not got any social media then put it there uh, and if you've got networking no social media put linkedin there if you've got social media and you haven't got networking, then put LinkedIn here. So you can all join LinkedIn. Then the evidence for your networking would be, I've got this LinkedIn profile. Okay. Try and put something useful on your LinkedIn profile. Just as I just don't create it and leave it blank because some of the supervisors will click through and go, oh, well, they've got LinkedIn, but there's nothing there. It's not really acting as any kind of networking thing. So become at least slightly active within LinkedIn if you take that as your approach. You put on your LinkedIn whatever you need to sell yourself. LinkedIn is Facebook for getting a job. Now, so you need to, reflecting on networking can be as simple as saying, I'm not very good at it, I need to get better. And then coming up with your plan as to what you're gonna do. Now, social media is an interesting thing. So I had somebody on Tuesday who said, 
I can't do that because I don't have any social media. And I go, are you absolutely sure you're not on any social connective network at all? You never do anything on social media. You're never on WhatsApp. You're never on YouTube. You're never on. So, for example, nutritionists and people involved in exercise and nutrition, they tend to build either an Instagram or a YouTube presence. You've seen lots about influencers. But then again, there's danger if you're some, something like a Twitter user and you decide to video yourself attacking the US Capitol. That's going to wreck your employability for the foreseeable future. So social media can be dangerous if you don't think about what you're doing. So there's a big article about the job losses during COVID. And it was saying that people attend, uh, the shocking thing was of all the job losses in the US, 150,000 last month, they were all women. It doesn't affect uh, COVID, What's happening is men are getting rehired and the women are getting losing their jobs for longer periods of time. Anyway, the New York Times, and I think the BBC did an article on it as well, saying about how people were trying to earn money during COVID. And so they were talking about OnlyFans. Now, if you've got a social media presence and that is part of the thing that comes up in your only fan in, in your social media presence. That might also be a dangerous thing that you don't want slapped all over your CV. So social media is fine, but just don't commit any white supremacist or general terrorist act. And perhaps don't publicize every single aspect of your life. I'm really guilty of this continuously uh, and I've got myself into any serious amounts of trouble. <gasps> You've been racist against the Karens. I know a person called Karen and she is the prototype of that. Uh, she's terrifying. And I'm white British and I still find her terrifying. Uh, so reflecting on social media, uh, I'm on Twitter. There are lots of people that have formed a good community uh, talking about COVID. Uh, so, for example, Trish Greenhouse, who's professor of public health at Oxford, uh, and other people like that are sharing all their knowledge about uh, epidemiology and what's going to happen with uh, COVID. So you can be well informed. You've got lots of communities you've built up. I mean, you've got your BMS WhatsApp group. There are lots of communities that are established. You can talk about who you follow. You can talk about whether it's in a how it is as an experience. So my son the other day, he was playing Warhammer Online. I can't, um, I've forgotten what game it falls under. Anyway, he was playing Warhammer. One of the other people who was in the particular campaign with him happens to be uh, one of the senior engineers for Volkswagen working on electric cars. My son is doing a degree in engineering and he wants to specialize in automotive engineering of electric cars. So he's managed to network by playing Warhammer and built a connection where this person is the senior, one of the most senior people of the entire of the US operation where they're doing that experimental uh, work on electric cars. So you never know where you're going to make a connection. You, you just can't know what you're going to have in common with people which are going to make. Uh, uh, you, you'll probably meet loads of dentists who are doing worlds of War, uh, Warcraft. You just can't imagine what other people are involved in your and those particular communities. So within my Twitter community, I find follow 5,000 people because of various uh, events, because I do statistics and I'm also like to give opportunities to as many people as possible. I'm a journal editor and this journal is a pure, was purely a science journal. Then they started getting 
some articles from social scientists. And in general, the science editors would look at this, go, that's social science, I'm not touching it. And the work wouldn't get published in the journal. And going, well, that's a bit unfair. So I said, okay, I'll look at some of these things if they're to do with statistical aspects. So one of the first things I was involved in was doing surveys to find out about the gay population within Uganda. Now that's really hard to do uh, because you can't just put it on the census saying, will you tell us about your sexuality? Because it's illegal to be gay in Uganda and they can kill you. Not a good thing. So you have to figure out statistical methods for finding out information that people can't share publicly because it's dangerous to their life. So that got me interested in in how how do you do that? How do you find out about things which are very difficult for people to share? And because of that, I ended up as the uh, getting all the papers that were sent to the journal that involved LGBTQIA issues. That, so I got the whole lot. They all got sent to me because I'd done that one thing. And I'm going, but I don't know anything about this particularly. I was just doing it in for it for the statistics. So I once wrote some comments. Uh, uh, so they were looking at the Australian census and they wondered, you're writing the census, how would you put the question to do with gender on the census? Doesn't seem particularly complicated, but it is. So what they were doing was they were looking at the transgender community and they were trying to find out how they would fill in the form on the census. And they found out something interesting, which is that male to female transgender uh, put themselves as quite a fixed gender. So they would definitely fix themselves in female and they have very few uh, days when they have dysphoria and feel that they're anything other than the female gender. But female to male trans, they're much more gender fluid. So depending on when you ask them depends on where they would put themselves within the gender scale. So I was commenting about that and how we should build in and much more tolerance in the censorship, censor form and how we should address these kinds of issues. And I was talking about it on um, Twitter and supporting trans issues. And there are a few conservatives who really did not, social conservatives who really didn't like my opinion. So they went after me, like severely. And they sent uh, tweets to the uh, university saying that I was a danger to my students. Like, what? What, am I, what? Exactly. What am I going to do? Go to my students and say you've got to change your sexuality because I'm involved in it now? What? I mean, who cares? Really? What are you doing? Well, not particularly cancelled me. Ugh, that's not going to happen. Uh, they just wanted me fired from my job. They weren't going to silence me on Twitter. Um, I've had, I was banned from Twitter because I created a list of all the people who were COVID deniers and general social conservatives who were anti-trans and that. all the people who caused me lots of trouble. And I put, called them idiots, but I, I put a slightly rude word in front of the idiots. Um, and so I was banned for 24 hours until I removed that list. So some of the people who I had put on that list as a retaliation put definite child abuser put me on a list labeled definite child abuser. So I was going, what? So I was banned because I was breaking the policy and doing targeted harassment. And I'm going, but that is targeted harassment because you are actually libeling me and committing a, a, a criminal act in doing so. But anyway, I, no, not a criminal act, it's a tort, but I could see them. Um, so I reported their list saying that I was a paedophile and I and Twitter responded saying, oh, no, that's fine. And I go, what? So it's not fine for me to call them something idiots, but it is fine for them to say that I'm a sex abuser. Don't get how this works. It doesn't really bug me, but it would be teeny bit inconvenient. Um, if you get some of these vigilante groups coming around and smacking you one. Yeah, the cancel culture from the social conservatives tends to be their default. Let's call it everybody who we don't like a pedophile. Why they go choose that particular thing, got no idea. 
but it just happens all the time. So watch social media. Think about our balance. So I've probably shot myself in the foot continuously uh, because I just so completely mad on social media and I have a tendency to say the honest truth uh, about fellow scientists when I think their work is totally dire, apart from I'm not going to state it in such moderate terms. <laughs> um, I've upset several important professors, but they're simply wrong and tough. That's life. <laughs>